My assumptions about religion, my own religion and others, is that religion is not private, it is personal, but has public implications. although the conserving role is also important. Um, I think that Canada's history in accommodation and inclusion and human rights between religions and between secular people has not been sterling. Um, Canada's religious history, as we all know, has been overwhelmingly Christian, and most of the fights have taken place between Catholics and Protestants. Um, religious minorities have always been present, but we've dealt with them quite expeditiously. We've uh, colonized the Aboriginal people. Uh, we've excluded the Jews from, um, for some time. Uh, you remember the um, famous story of the ship that was turned back during the Second World War, the, the uh, <coughs> book that was written by Abella, None is Too Many. And uh, we have uh, ignored some of the other religious communities because they're so small we can afford to and we're in a uh, dominant position. So although Muslims have been over in Canada for over 100 years, we still uh, have not come to terms with that fact. I think the decision makers uh, in the past, due to history, have been uh, mainly white, male, and uh, European oriented. Um, even white privileged women such as myself were excluded from political life, uh, certainly till 1927 when we were suddenly declared persons. Um, we, we celebrated that in the Senate when I was there and everybody was furious because the women senators were at the head of the line and the commoners who'd been elected said, you people weren't even elected. So I said, well, read your history. So um, and now, of course, we face a different situation. Um, the Christian majority has made, I think, significant contributions to our common life uh, through the um, founding of universities, which most of which are now, are now secular and turned over to the public. Um, one of the sticking points has been pointed out by the rabbi is the laws, the system, judicial systems, which uh, we now have to uh, reevaluate because our laws are based on the British system, um, common law, with the Christian ethos. The uh, holidays which we uh, celebrate publicly, of course, have been all Christian, and that needs to be looked at. In public events, uh, for in the past, the Christian prayer along with God Save the Queen, and state banquets always had a Christian blessing before the meals. Uh, in legislatures, even Parliament, uh, Christian prayers were offered. When I entered the Senate, I examined the prayer with which we opened, and they kind of done something about it, but it's not very good yet. So the issues of accommodation, exclusion, human rights are still there. Uh, Karen pointed out that um, the UN Declaration of Human Rights was crafted by a Canadian, uh, but uh, the World Council of Churches, of which we're, uh, the Christian churches here in Canada are members, was very instrumental in, in that uh, document as well, um, which guaranteed uh, freedom of thought and conscience though it often fell short of implementation. Um, we've, there are two main UN covenants, the one on civil and political rights, which uh, we've, we've done not too badly, although adjustments have to be made there. The one on economic, social, and cultural rights, however, uh, was not signed by Lester Pearson, uh, but the government of the day, because they thought that would cost us money. Well, of course it would. <laughs> And so we continue to exclude uh, women, for example, who need single women who need bank loans and things like that. We've not really taken seriously economic rights at all in Canada, in my view. Um, so the, the covenants remain. They're there, but um, particularly the, the failure to even sign the economic, social, and cultural one or the implementation means that the, we have uh, embraced the current uh, model of globalization which increases the gap between the rich and the poor and the individual and the community. And as for environmental rights, I'll leave that up to your judgment. Well, there has been a sea change. Uh, what, what do we do now? I'd like to talk about uh, theological concepts in Christian religion which I think are relevant to human rights and social justice. And I think they are certainly not exclusive of the other faith communities, in fact, intersect at various points. There are uh, three, three things, I think, that we can 
make we can make a contribution. One is the uh, the Christian uh, belief that a person is a person in relationships. That of course is comes out of the the Jewish community as well. That we're fully people when we are in compassion, reciprocal, and just relationships with other human beings and with the earth. And that further, a community is a community when it brings people of very different sensibilities and backgrounds and histories and faiths together. It, it affirms their particularity, but also brings them into life-giving and life-sustaining relationships with each other. So the view of the human person as of infinite value, but relational and therefore only fully a person in full community, I think is a contribution that needs to be made and said widely. The second one is, uh, a lot of Christians are gonna be upset with me now, but the second one is uh, the Christian view of salvation. And I don't think it's just Christian. I think I, we would be better to go back to the root meaning of that word salvation, which is bandied so easily on our lips. Um, look at the root meaning in Hebrew, Greek and Latin. In Hebrew, if I'm not mistaken, I'm open to correction here. Uh, salvation means uh, wide, spacious, liberated, free, not shoved into a corner, free to uh, realize one's own growth. It has wide horizons. It's certainly based, it's communal, it's community. And then the Greek one, the Greek understanding is freedom from, deliverance from the sea or from disease or from wrong thoughts or from this, that, and the other thing. It's deliverance from. And the Latin salvation, the root meaning is authenticity or integrity of being, just what a human being ought to be. Authenticity or integrity or faithfulness. So when one looks at all three of those understandings of linguistically at least of the root meaning of salvation, I think there is a common basis for human beings to, to look at what kind of community we want to build and what kind of a world we want to live in. And the, other con the third contribution I think is that of the ecumenical community which we represent here today. Now that word ecumenical, my son says never use it because people don't understand it, it's too hard. And certainly when uh, recently the President of the, or the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches was in Toronto. We tried to get him interviewed by the Globe and Mail on the basis that he had a great ecumenical story. The reporter's eyes glazed over and said, there isn't a story there, go away. <laughs> He's probably right. So what does ecumenical mean? Well, it's a very simple, it's not too hard. It's quite like economical, which we use all the time. But again, the root word is oikos, meaning the house, the household, the whole house, all of us, everybody in the house, the house, oikos. And from that, that, that Greek word comes economy, uh, meaning the management of, management of the household, and ecology, meaning our relationship to the environment, and ecumenical. Now ecumenical uh, means, as in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the oikumeni, the whole inhabited world, and all they that dwell therein. Christians have very much narrowed it down to some of my best friends are Jews, <laughs> which is a pity. <laughs> but that is, we've lost the fullness of that concept, the whole inhabited world. So, um, we bring those, those, those tasks here. The environmental task, I think, and the human rights of the earth, I think, is one of the huge challenges of the future. Uh, whether, uh, whether we still consider it that uh, human beings are in charge of it and it's there for our use only, or whether we are able to develop a symbiotic relationship with the earth so that we are taught by the earth or we learn from it, I think that's one of the reasons I'm a canoeist because to immerse yourself in, in, in the earth at some point is, is very useful, certainly to me. So what are the, what are the uh, challenges for the future then? I think there are three, three or four, well there are a lot, and we're gonna turn up, we've got identified several of them here. Certainly the largest issue on human rights in Canada is the Aboriginal legacy that the dominant society has created. Um, 
We're working towards some resolution, but it's going to take lifetimes. Uh, recently, I met an Anglican priest from South Africa, Mark uh, Lapsey, Michael Lapsey, and uh, during the last days of apartheid, he'd opened a parcel bomb and had his lost, and when it exploded, and he lost his arms from the elbows down and one eye. And I said to him, how long, Michael, was it before you were able to uh, feel like a full human being again? He said, well, some time, because people came into my office and kept saying, well, Michael, or the hospital, you know, it's too bad you won't be able to do this, 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 and this anymore. It's too bad, but it's happened. Till finally, he said, somebody came in and said, Michael, you are now perfectly situated to start an institute for reconciliation between people who hate each other. And that's what he's done. And then he said to me, uh, I could be I would be glad to help you in Canada <laughs> if you need help, and I think you do. I think that um, the whole business of reconciliation um, needs to go far beyond tolerance. I don't know if you've ever been tolerated. It's a terrible position to be in. <laughs> I hate being tolerated. <laughs> so we need to go beyond that to see what we can do together. Um, so the Aboriginal question is certainly there, and it's not the Aboriginal question, it's the dominant society question, because we're the ones who did the colonizing. Another one is um, environmental, as I've mentioned, and are we able to uh, become symbiotic with nature rather than to control it, or to even to be stewards of it? Um, how to build comprehensive, inclusive community that will affirm the differences and the particularity of each of us, because if we don't do that, we've lost it, but also to bring us into life-giving relationships with each other. I don't know if you remember after 9-11, when there was a, a, a service on Parliament Hill uh, commemorating the loss of the Twin Towers, and uh, it was a bunch of music, and then they had all the religious leaders sitting in the front, not one of which was allowed to open their mouths. And I think the government was scared silly that they lose votes if they, they don't know how to handle it. So instead of affirming the particularity of each religious community and the rich resources that they're able to bring to human community, they just threw it all out and said, no, we'll take care of it. I think that is not the way to go. Finally, um, there's a theologian, Walter Brueggemann, in the USA, who says that we live simultaneously in two worlds, in the presumed world, which is the world um, of every day, we get up, we eat breakfast, we go to have a job, we go home, and so on and so forth. That's a presumed world, but there's also the proposed world, and the proposed world is what religions are about. The proposed worlds of imagination, the world of joy and compassion and law and equality and inclusion, which does not yet exist here, but exists. That is the only reality. And so the function of religious communities, in my view, is to bring to the secular community and to each other the best of the proposed world and to make it incarnate in the life we live together. Thank you.